And I'd love just, just to like wrap up, just getting at what's at the root of green capitalism, like what we saw in our role play right here. What was at the root of what the corporation was doing? Or what's at the root of these sorts of um, types of greening of a capitalist system? So it can like think of it as congruent with what we did here. Like what kind of values are what are what's driving this, these activities, these economies? Renewable energy. Of green capitalism? Mm -hmm. What's driving green capitalism? Profit. What do you profit. Profit. Yeah. Profit. yeah, why do you think why do you think capitalism is interested in renewable energy? Profit. Like, profit. Yeah. De deception and externalization of real costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely externalization. Yeah, I mean, at the worst case, but it's it's nowhere near as bad as it was thirty or forty years ago. For who? For anybody. Well, I would argue that there's lots of groups that have it just as bad as thirty years ago, if not worse. It shifts, but it changes. But ultimately, like. Indigenous groups displaced right now, like through giant land grabs, for things like growing biodiesel. Like that's a solution that's on the table right now, displacing thousands of groups of these people. So it's like, yes, it, it'll change and it'll be different. Different groups of people. And maybe the big conservation groups one day will be pro-indigenous groups, and tomorrow they won't be. It depends on what can advance their bottom line. Sally? I guess like the one thing that went unstated or unquestioned is whether or not we should be drinking soy milk. And probably the answer is no. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but also, so then how do you how do you reconcile like that conflict there between you know the indigenous land and the um, and, and the availability of biodiesel, which is arguably much better than petroleum. So the question, if we want any way out of that conflict, is to say that well, we shouldn't be using combustion engines. Or maybe I kind of think that what you're getting at is this idea that there are needs that for soy milk or for combustion things to fill our combustion engines that are fueling green capital. Yeah. They have power to specific group, a small group of people. So a small group of people holding the power. Holding the power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Progress? And like sustaining progress? What do you mean by sustaining progress? So like if I have a example soy milk company, um, I will grow bigger and I'll be able to, I mean, it goes along with profits, I guess. So growth. Yeah, growth. Growth. Unending growth. Infinite growth. Yeah. Um, An overconsumption by all. So, Darren, Ooh, or if a uh, uh, perceived uh, no, desire for autonomy that's being uh, channeled into socially acceptable methods, uh, I want to make the ethical decision. Let me pick which project is more ethical. Product is more ethical. Right. That the, bad kind of thing. Uh, no, not that. Uh, desire for autonomy being channeled into socially acceptable means. Desire for autonomy is what's fueling it. So it's what means everything else. So you're saying that desire for autonomy, to certain extent, gets people to say, I want to make the right decision, I'll get a different product. Mm -hmm. And that means all the prejudice. So consumer activism? Yeah. Consumer. Um, yeah. Yeah, along those lines, the, it, it's the exploitation of a growing awareness of humans' impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like, as we come to understand what we're actually doing to the world, people are trying to make conscious choices, and that's being exploited by the green capitalist industry. So keeping the system that we have. Keeping the system. Yeah, so it's sort of like giving it a... So the status quo yeah, or inertia exactly is fueling green capitalism. These are great. Okay. Yeah, these are awesome. So that's that's like a great um great like food for this awesome green capitalism tree. <laughs> I'm I wanted to kind of like to get us thinking about how this is not today was not just about silk and not just about like corporations. What other ways do we see these values?
is playing out. What does green capitalism look like? Like, what other things are we seeing coming up right now as capitalism is trying to turn more green? Like, what? What are the what leaves and the fruits of the, the tree? The leaves <laughs> and the fruits of green capitalism. So one is, for example, one is the greenwashing of corporations. That's kind of what we focus on today. But there's lots of other leaves on this tree. So let's hear some. Trina? Oh, okay. See, Wayne knows that's at Walmart. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Um, lead certified buildings. Mm. Can you explain what that is so maybe not everyone knows? So, LEAD is an acronym uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And they have, I believe, four different levels bronze, silver, gold, platinum. And if you follow their little wickets, you get certain points for how green your construction is. And so some of the things are like putting down a bunch of hay so that you, your soil isn't a road on the construction project that you're working on. If you, I don't know, use a bunch of extra insulation, you have up to R, whatever, 30 insulation, the walls, more weatherized, um, so then you're making a higher quality building, theoretically. But it's kind of in the greenwashing category because it's not actually looking at the end product or the, um, the system. And so at the end of the day, it's not saying, how efficient is this building? It's just this little individualized, segmented rubric that if you just fit inside this little wicket, you can make your building platinum, which you can put all over your website and your business cards and say, you know, we're in a platinum facility. You know, there's no VOCs, but um, doesn't Maybe necessarily add. that insulation. Yeah, it might not actually be as green at the end of the day, although it is a framework that is being used that is much better than not happy. Um, so the thought that we can just replace what we're doing with something more green, so that so like let's say we take okay solar panels right they have quote unquote less a smaller impact on the environment, but it's just where we're. Um, like we're not reducing our consumption. We're just trying to replace it with something. I'm not like, the best at this kind of thing. <laughs> um, like continue consuming at the same rate that we yes. have been, kind of maintain the same like um, standard of living in the global north that we have. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you look at like what it takes to make solar panels, what happens after they compose all that, it's general. I would say like a different examples like a green baby washing. So, you know, the byproducts for the babies are green, mm. you know, or we can say uh, like a clean transportation, electric cars, still, we're still using, you know, almost the same, instead of a, like a biking or something like that, you know. It's like, yeah. Exactly, or questioning, you know, car culture and our transportation infrastructure and be like, is this a, the best way to plan out our cities for cars? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. Or green, green pets, you know, all these products for, for pets, how they are green, all these things that are selling, that selling for pets. Um, so, it's, yeah, there are different ways that, you know, the capitalist system is just trying to, I mean, what, I mean yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. What else can people think of? Capitalism is like legitimized as a system even further than it was before because we stop. Um, it, it's like another um, tier of things that we take for granted, like um, electricity, like coal powered electric plants or whatever. Um, you take that for granted when you make the consumer this level decision of like, I want an electric car instead of oil, a gasoline powered car. It's like a deepening of our acceptance of. The legitimacy of capitalists. Um, exactly, this is like feel good capitalism in a way. Like we're still in capitalism, but we can all feel free of that. What were you gonna say? <laughs> um, the <laughs> wait, wait, something else. Um, that we're just replacing things. Oh, biodiesel. So mm -hmm. sort of like we're using more energy to produce less energy, and we're thinking that's a good thing. And we're not really uh, thinking about how how the you know the end equation, right? So we just keep doing that because all those costs are externalized; mm -hmm. they sort of go into the ether somewhere. But some people feel that yeah, those costs exactly. Because mm -hmm. there's like a myth around it, like the the myth of renewable fuels, like that or renewable energy is this big lie. I just 
I think we're changing, exchanging one set of lives for another. Um, and compostable utensils have to be the most insane thing. <laughs> Just, I was thinking about, um, um, like, um, the capital system takes all the exploitation of women all over the planet because there are uh, women are not paid the same rate, uh, you know, that, uh, as male we are, yeah, and that happens all over the planet. M women are totally being exploited, um, and indigenous groups. So the capital system or the green, you know, washing is using the same structures of power to, yeah. to exploit all the resources and, and the people and women included there and indigenous groups. So green capitalism doesn't address patriarchy, it doesn't address sexism. Right, it's, it's doesn't still the same structures. Right. Yeah. Right. Doesn't address classism. Aragon, and that will be our last comment. Yeah. I guess I think it's like what it refers to is the I guess, you know, the myth of agency for all, uh, taking the the, the changing you know, the, the responsibility of, you know, our society to create a greener world and shifting it under the burden of each individual. One of the issues, you know, not to put your spot, you said people need to consume less. The question is who, which people, and I wrote down there are people in Bangladesh and even some of the US who cannot consume enough. And there are people uh, who, could, who are consuming more than they technically would need to ultimately. However, they cannot survive in the current conditions without consuming that amount. Uh, but maybe they'll to survive with much less. You know, say someone who needs a car to get to work, but could, could take public transportation if there was public transportation for them. So it sounds like we're talking about unequal distribution yeah. of resources. Mm -hmm. Not just resources, a false yeah. idea of choice. You've got all these uh, rather irritating rich people, or more actually rather irritating upper middle class people who say, you need to be as green as us, look at our whole food shopping. Everyone's probably encountered that sort. And it's like, well, there are some of the people sitting who, who can't afford what what is so-called green stuff? It gives environmental activism. It gives it straight to the rich. You can get what I'm trying to say. The illusion of agency for everyone. Mm -hmm. Dependency on inefficient and exploitive systems. Yes. The myth of progress. Yeah. <laughs> so wow, this so, is a great. Movie. Right. So we're at the last five minutes of our workshop, pretty much. Um, obviously, <laughs> this tree needs to grow. We need want leaves. I was thinking, as we're wrapping up, maybe in this question, when we're talking about, um, you know, we have a couple of sections talking about uh, what type of green solidarity we address. I'd love to hear people in the end, like, incorporating ideas that they've seen for how our values are playing out in the green solidarity economy. That we're building. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I'd like to open it up to just kind of like debrief this workshop, like what areas of the green solidarity economy did we address today in the workshop? And how does it relate to what we heard earlier in the plenary? Are we, are we doing the fruit of this tree now? I don't yes. think we have time. We're, we're not doing it specifically, but if you want to tie in what's fruiting minutes. over here, definitely. Yeah. So read the question again, what was the So the question is, what areas of the green solidarity economy did we address in the session? What are the ideas? And how does it tie into the plenary? That's a big question. Don't we do the tree? <laughs> I think we're trying to do both together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. How about stakeholder involvement? You know, so everybody has a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So equal access. Well, we broke down the word green a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So critical or like a critique of green. It looks like a, like a Dean's Beans in Amherst that actually goes to the place where they're getting their coffee beans and making the relationships. And so, right, CEO from over here going down to the indigenous group, you know, walking through the factory, right, seeing exactly how the whole li line of the process goes. And so, you know, Dean's Beans set a model where people all over the country are learning 
you know, how to you know roast beans and have a at least a, a move forward towards a sustainable coffee system um, by that that transparency and the relationships between the different um, interested not not just interested parties but the parties involved. So obviously, different Are you people there. And trust between those parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Having a cradle to cradle system for means of production. Do you want to say more about what that means? Um, yeah, so like you address every element of production. So, like, it's not cradle to grade, it's a sustaining system that continues fueling the. It's on I guess. So like something's made, it's used, and then it goes back into the cycle rather than made, use, landfill, or your lungs via incinerator. Do you guys think that fair trade Where is that, is that a, is that a flawed system? I think it's another one of those things that makes people feel good about buying and it perpetuates the dependence of the capitalist system. It's just another, you know, it's another buzzword. Another, it's like we all we want to have a good relationship with like the deans being with the producers and the, 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 the vendors and stuff. But I don't know. Fair trade, excuse me. I'm not sure how I feel about that anymore. Well, it's just the slightly modified version of the exact same thing. You're not right. paying for a product who, from people who along, all along the production chain have organized their own work themselves. They're, you're paying a company that pays workers wages to do an assigned activity or else get the hell out of it. Like, okay, right. No, I agree with that. I wasn't sure exactly like how fair trade is regulated or, or uh, how it actually works, but yeah. This so like a Dean's Beans model. <laughs> There's a, this also might tie in. Are there ways that the ideas and initiatives addressed in this session could be expanded to include or support other aspects of the solidarity economy? Yes. <laughs> yes. Got it. All right. I think I would say I would just push for what we're doing in this activity right now. Just like what other like ways are these things we're brainstorming supported by other systems? Like how how are they we continuing to build off of these? to meet all, our, all the needs we talked about earlier. So um, we can read them out loud to yeah. remind ourselves. We have creativity, diversity, meeting more than just the basic human needs, mutual respect, tools, fairness, risk, taking risks for change, compassion, resilience, stable climate, self-expression, simple life, interdependence. These are most of them. Democratic discussion space, accountability, recognizing the environment. Maybe like space where like grievances can be aired and like issues between different parties can be worked through um, without one party having like more power than another. Um, so it could kind of the idea of a democratic space, but going into like an economic democratic space of um, negotiations. Economic democracy. Yeah. Egalitarian accountability. Would that mean recallability? What's like that? Recallability for you know, your representative democracy. Like, not just they need to become available so that you can talk to them, but like their own recallability based on your needs. And is that at all? I don't know. I, don't know. I think that's like one part of what. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to add on. I was, what is the word recallability? Like, you're allowed to 
So say we're a factory, us three, and we're like, okay, we have discussion. We send Callista off to go talk to super, I don't know, another group of people who are in this product chain or something. And then Callista's like not representing us, so we're like, and you have to come back here. Recall. Recall. <laughs> Does that explain oh. what you're doing yet? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, partly. Partly. But like, um, it's more than that. Yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of the, who the. Um, well, it's like horizontal integration. Like you, you're not. You don't just want the person who the CEO to be available. You want the CEO to be responsive. Right. You have to have some control over. It. I think it gets at like the relationship on. between these two is is actually like tension almost like. This isn't just a space for airing grievances because, like, we don't want a democracy where we can complain really well. Yeah. Like, we want to have those relationships actually mean something and have the solidarity between maybe all of these groups to build something different instead of, like, well, there's still a king up there and we're going to complain. Yeah. Ability to complain is to complain is important. It is important. important. Part of that. But the idea of having horizontal integration is that, like, who you're complaining to is, like, everyone else who also has equal autonomy and control in that situation. <laughs> so. so it's less of a complaint and more of a negotiation on equal terms. Like, I think it's getting at exactly what you said. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Inspired from here, over here. <laughs> Best. <laughs> but that's a conversation for a whole other workshop. Yeah. Potentially at the party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, and that's actually that's a great point. That's something that came up when we were planning this workshop. Was like, you know, we've got this two traits, and of course it's great for thinking about how um, things emerge in our values. But where does resistance fit into that? Where is resistance in this picture? And I think, yeah, it's because we are. In reality, living amidst all this, we're like living on these branches. We want to plant a seed that grows this. Um, so, how do we start, you know, carrying this apart to grow a different tree in its place? That's where we get into lots of theories about how that will work. <laughs> <laughs> Some are like, this tree will grow so big it'll fall on this tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are like, <laughs> It'll grow so tall, the sun will be blocked, and it will die. Yeah. <laughs> or some people are like, we'll be little bugs, and eventually one day, it will just rot. Yeah. Bugs will flip a switch, and then all of a sudden, different kinds of fruit will grow off the same <laughs> But regardless of what sort of idea you have about getting rid of this tree, I think um, coming up with real concrete ways, those groups that have their different ideas can actually work together and make it happen. It's more important than who's right about tree growth and death. So. <laughs> and I think this is getting at a lot of themes of earlier in the plenary of like, you know, we need to be pursuing a way where there are many ways. We need to be, you know, by all means possible changing the way that our economy works. It's not going to be turning on one and turning on another. It's not, we're not all going to put our energy in the same place. And there's probably going to be coexistence and there already is of both of these types of economies and of all many different types of economies. So um, there are many of these saplings already around, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you may have seen them. This tree yeah. is still pretty strong. Yeah. So really this, okay. strong. We might take, if anyone has burning last thoughts, we can take them. Otherwise, I think we should probably wrap up because our time is almost running out. One interesting thing with the plenary is um, one speaker said that even as we like build a new system, we should still like you know help out Walmart workers getting good wages and stuff. But this almost shows like the flip side, which is that better within green capitalism mm -hmm. might actually be worse, like still having lots of bad effects everywhere. So it's conflict all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the idea. If we if we just give up. And let this tree grow really big one day, it'll be okay. And like, it'll collapse and we'll be over there somehow. That's probably true. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Anyone have final last closing comments? Let's chop down the tree. <laughs> 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 <laughs>